Okay, hi. So today I'm actually going to do a talk which is related to some of the talks I've given previously on analysis of um, energy balance and analysis of metabolic rate and also analysis of food intake. Um, because in those talks, when we were trying to calculate metabolic rate from energy expenditure data, one of the things we had to do was correct for the effect of body weight. And to do so, we used a statistical technique called ANCOVA. And in this talk, I'm just going to show you how to actually do that in a stats package. So what am I talking about? So first of all, what is ANCOVA? What is this thing? And why ANCOVA is a thing in biomedical science, particularly related to energy expenditure? And then also how to do an ANCOVA, how to actually perform it, how to check your ANCOVA is correct, because there are certain assumptions that have to be met for ANCOVA to be valid. And finally, what to do when the assumptions of the ANCOVA are not met, and you can't correct, say, energy expenditure for body weight and meet these requirements for a valid ANCOVA. What do you then do with that data? Because you still want to use it. You want to present it because that has value. And then what we'll do at the end, because this is a video and people can pause and start again, we'll just do a quick run through of how to actually do the ANCOVA in JASP so you can see it in action. And if you want to, you can go back and do it yourselves. Okay, so what is ANCOVA? So ANCOVA is analysis of covariance. So it's, it's similar to ANOVA, which is analysis of variance, but it is a general linear model and it blends ANOVA, which deals with categorical variables, so wild type knockout, HET, there's three different categorical variables, but also regression, so continual variables like body weight in our case. So what ANCOVA will do is it will evaluate whether the means of a dependent variable, so in our case, the dependent variable will be energy expenditure, it is the thing we're interested in, are equal across levels of a categorical independent variable, wild type knockout, um, often called a treatment, while statistically controlling for the effects of other continuous variables that are not of primary interest, known as covariates uh, or nuisance variables. And we'll see what we mean by nuisance variable. In our case, the most common covariate we're dealing with is body weight. Um, now, mathematically, ANCOVA decomposes the variance in the dependent variable, energy expenditure, into variance explained by the covariates, um, such as body weight, and variance explained by the categorical independent variables, wild type knockout, and residual variance, i.e. what is not explained by body weight and genotype. So intuitively, ANCOVA can be thought of as adjusting the dependent variable, so adjusting the energy expenditure by the group means of the covariance. So for example, what would the energy expenditure of my wild types and my knockout mice be if every mouse weighed 30 grams, and then can we compare those and see if they all weighed 30 grams, would it be higher or lower? So that's what we're doing with an ANCOVA. So what is a nuisance variable? Well, you can see here a really nice example of this, and this is bat weight. So bat is a really plastic tissue in terms of its mass because it contains lipid droplets. And if you want to get rid of those lipid droplets from brown adipose tissue, you can do a couple of things. You can shove it in the cold for 24 hours and you'll basically remove almost all the lipid, or you can just fast the mice overnight and that'll burn through quite a lot of the lipid. And this causes a problem if you're doing an experiment where say you're cutting up a bunch of mice and it's taking you 20, 30 minutes to cut up a mouse because you're harvesting all the tissues and you want to do it faster. Well, you fast your mice overnight, 16 hours for the first mouse. By the time you're getting out to 24 hours, if you're doing an eight hour day, well, the weight has fallen dramatically from about 450 milligrams down to about 300 milligrams. And so obviously, if you did this, it would be bad. But if you had all your knockouts as the second half of your cut up and all of your wild types as the first half, you would find that there was, in fact, a difference in that weight. But that difference in that weight would be driven purely by your nuisance variable of how long it took to actually do the experiment because you can't come all up at once. So you could control for that statistically using ANCOVA. So that's a nuisance variable. And so why ANCOVA and metabolism? Well, in concept, back in 2011, energy balance, the game has changed. Uh, there was a paper came out from Matthias Schopp et al um, in Nature Methods, and it really put forward a concept of how you should do analysis of energy expenditure, energy balance, and also calculate metabolic rate. And so this was great in, uh, in theory. And why this came out was because people were, had been using comparators to straight body weight 
to correct for the effect of body weight on energy expenditure. People knew there was a problem in that larger animals tended to expend more energy. And this introduced a lot of variance, a lot of nuisance noise into energy expenditure data. And so the idea was that you should divide by body weight in some way to correct and uh, determine metabolic rate, energy expenditure per unit of mass. Um, and there were already, it was already known that just dividing by straight body weight was a problem because we know that energy expenditure has a relationship to the surface area of the organism. And so people were using comparators like body weights 0 0.75, 0 0.72, or 0.66 to try and account for this fact that it's actually the surface area, which is effectively a square function um, relative to, uh, to the length of the animal, um, was actually an important factor and maybe more important than actually taking a cubic function of body weight. And so they were developed for comparing across species, i.e. elephants, mice, rather than within species. And evidence suggests that they're not actually valid comparators for comparing, particularly within species, though there is some argument that they're not that great for even comparing across species. Um, and so therefore describing oxygen consumption or energy expenditure as milliliters per minute to kilogram or uh, 0.75 or joules per minute to kilogram 0.75, it's not a great idea. The question was, is there a better method? And what this paper really put forward was ANCOVA. And that was great because what would then happen is everyone would start using ANCOVA and we would no longer have the problem whereby a fat mouse, as a result of a mathematical function, automatically has a low metabolic rate. And that was a big problem. We'll show that in the next couple of slides. But it didn't work. And in fact, some of the authors on that paper went back some eight years later, and they had a look at all the articles out there in, I think it was journals with an impact factor greater than 15. And they found 77 articles um, in the past eight years, uh, between 2019 and 2011. And they looked to see which ones had used which types of analysis. And strikingly, the very largest chunk of this pie um, over half of the articles were still using ratios. So this hadn't been adopted. And there are reasons for it, which we'll see in a minute, that these ratios give you really compelling, nice results that seem logical and are easy to explain. But they also think that there's a problem with just knowing how to do the technique and being confident to know how to do the technique and also what to do when it goes wrong. And so hopefully we'll cover that in this talk. So just a quick recap, what is energy balance and what is metabolic rate and how do they differ? Okay, so energy balance. Energy balance describes whether an organism will lose or gain weight and the size of the organism is actually irrelevant for considering energy balance. We can think of a mouse, 30 gram mouse, if it eats the equivalent of 31 grams of food and it expends the equivalent of 30 grams of energy out and this 31 grams of food is in mouse units, um, it will gain weight, it will become 31 gram mouse because there is more going in than coming out. And if we do the same with an elephant, one ton and one gram in, one ton of energy out, then the elephant is going to gain one gram. And obviously there will be a difference in terms of weight gain. This is 3% weight gain. And if that keeps up, the animal will rapidly get bigger and bigger and bigger as a proportion of its starting body weight. However, your elephant, if your elephant is gaining one gram, that's something like uh, one millionth of its body weight. So it's going to take a long time for your elephant to demonstrate an appreciable change in its mass as a proportion of its diet mass. Metabolic rate is slightly different um, because the size of the organism is very important as we care about the rate of energy per gram of the organism. So obviously we can think about this example, which is 30 gram mouse again, five grams of food in, five grams of energy out, and that will remain weight stable. Well, this mouse, 30 gram mouse, seven grams of food in, seven grams of energy out, that will also remain weight stable, but the metabolism going on in that organism will be radically different because the second mouse, if this is over the same time period, is expending 40% more energy. And this really does happen with murine um, experiments. The big factor is temperature. So you can more than double the metabolic rate of a mouse by moving it from 30 degrees to five degrees C, and you will more than double the metabolic rate. So this is, this is pertinent and relevant to laboratory-based settings. So going back to this, why can't we justify by straight body weight? I mean, it seems straightforward. We wanna know metabolic rate 
and that's energy expenditure per gram of organism. Let's just divide by the number of grams. The problem with this is that we do not see an intercept between the relationship between body weight and energy expenditure at the origin. And what happens when we divide by our energy expenditure by our body weight is we effectively determine the slope of this line. Um, y divided by X gives us the slopes of these lines. And so whilst these animals are lying on the same regression slope, if we take the heaviest and the lightest, they will have different slopes. Um, and as I've mentioned already, this is because they're not on the origin. The cut through at zero grams body weight is not zero joules per minute per mouse. It's in this case at around about 10. And there are some reasons for this. Um, there's parts of the mouse are not metabolic. Mineral bone doesn't expend any energy. Fur doesn't expend any energy. And also there are compositional effects going on where there are different energy rates for fat mass versus different energy rates for lean mass. So as you change body weights, you are not necessarily going to have a nice linear homogeneous mount change in what is the proportion of different bits of your mouse. Okay. And you can sort of see an extreme example if we had a very small mouse and they exist, six gram mice, and if it were to stay on this regression slope, you would estimate that the energy expenditure of the six gram mouse per gram of body weight was in fact more than double this angle here, more than double that of a 30 gram mouse, but in fact, it was just carrying on the same regression slope. And why this so really still so popular is because of this phenomenon. And it is the phenomenon that heavy mice in such a structure will ex appear to expend less energy than lighter mice. So this data from a couple hundred mice we got from uh, the Sangha. Um, and this was from their MGP pipeline. So these are mice on a Western diet and also from the MGP Select, which is mice on a chow diet. And you can see the, the red dots, the chow mice, are lighter than the blue dots. That's why the blue dots are to the right on the body weight on the x-axis. Um, and obviously the mice in blue have slightly higher energy expenditure, but you can see this is actually two regression lines. They are actually sitting on the same regression line. And this is a phenomenon that we see in mice that if you keep them on a high fat or a Western diet for a decent length of time, we don't actually see a difference in metabolic rate, particularly if you've had them on for about 12 weeks. Acutely, you can get an increase in metabolic rate, which is something like the thermic effect of feeding or potentially diet induced thermogenesis. But it does seem over prolonged periods of time, we generally see this pattern of really very, very similar energy expenditures when corrected for body weight. And here in panel B, we corrected the energy expenditure um, for body weight using analysis of covariance. And it's saying they're exactly the same. But you can see that one end, the end nearest the red dots here of this um, regression line, is very much uh, going to have a very much steeper slope if we just divide this point energy expenditure by body weight than the other end. So if we then take each of these mice and we divide their energy expenditure by body weight, what we see is a very different pattern. And if the body weight correction was working perfectly, these lines should be flat because we've removed the effect of body weight on energy expenditure. But what you can see now is rather than being flat, we actually have a strong negative correlation. And in this case, we're actually using energy expenditure joules per minute to the gram 0.75. We're not even using body weight, which would make this even more extreme. We're using one of these ratio comparators. And then what we now see is that all of the red dots using this, this division by body weight to the 0.75, well, they're higher up on the y-axis than the blue dots. And we've got zillions of mice. So what we see is a nice compelling result. The fatter mice, which is the Western diet ones in blue, well, they're expending less energy. They have a lower metabolic rate, according to this analysis, than the red um, triangles here, which are the chow fed mice. So they are heavier because they expend less energy, which we see from the previous slide is completely untrue. At the point of measurement, their metabolic rate is identical. And in absolute terms, they're expending more energy. Their blue dots are further up the y axis than the red dots. But this is compelling because we want to explain why the blue mice are heavier. And if you use ratios, you will always, almost always, churn out this result that the heavier mouse has a lower metabolic rate than the lighter mouse.
And this, I think, is one of the reasons it persists. And so this is hugely relevant, what I've just shown you, given this data, given the fact that out of 77 articles in Impact Factor 15 or above journals, over half of them didn't even attempt to use ANCOVA. 10 of them didn't use normalization, which may be valid, because if you're doing energy balance, you don't normalize. So that could be a perfectly valid thing. Um, and then also ratios and no normalization. Again, you've got quite a few of these which are doing things multiple different ways. So you do need to decide if you're interested in metabolic rate or you're interested in energy balance, but I would argue therefore, we don't know in this case whether they were, but there could be 16 out of 77 articles have done what I would consider to be a um, biologically meaningful analysis of the energy expenditure or potentially biologically meaningful depending on what they were trying to explain, a difference in body weight versus a difference in metabolic rate. Okay, so one of the things I showed you there was that all of the mice on a Western diet had the same energy expenditure as the mice on a chow diet once we were correcting for body weight. But an important point is they're doing that because they're larger. So larger mice are going to expend more energy than smaller mice. This is why we get these positive correlations. And also these larger mice are gonna eat more food. So we would expect given their higher energy expenditure that these mice are also eating more food. And so therefore you've got these two phenomena kicking together. This mouse is expending more energy and expending and eating more food. So obviously we, we get this as a sort of effect. Um, whereby they remain in energy balance at this point, but we don't know at this point, unless they're verging in body weight, if it's energy expenditure or it is food intake that has led to them having this greater body weight. And so the critical point then is if we're looking at a stage where the mice are not diverging in body weight, we actually, like this point here, which is what our mice effectively are, they're heavier, but at the time they're being measured, they have the same energy expenditure, then it's really difficult to determine why they are obese. Instead, we need to go back to a period when they are diverging in weight, and then we need to look and see whether their food intakes and energy expenditure. Okay. So if fat mice usually expend more energy than thin mice, and a larger animals expend more energy, and the genotype of interest is obese and getting more obese relative to controls when we measure it, will it have a higher energy expenditure? So the answer to that is probably yes. And so this is something to not shy away from. If you have fat mice and you measure them in your calorimeter, you should expect them to have higher energy expenditure. And it may seem counterintuitive because you're like, oh, they're fat, but, they're but it just means they'll probably be eating even more food to offset that increase in energy expenditure. Even if they're diverging in body weight, even if they're getting heavier, their energy expenditure is still gonna be higher. And so what you really are asking then in that situation where you've got diverging mice, you've got them eating more food than the controls and you've got them expending more energy um, than the controls, is you wanna know if that energy expenditure is disproportionately high or low for the body weight. And that's where ANCOVA comes in. Because that's what ANCOVA does. It uh, allows us to adjust this dependent variable, energy expenditure, which we can see can be higher or lower depending on how obese the animals are, and adjust it for the body weight and let us analyze, analyze it as though all of the animals weighed the same. And that's what we're really looking to do. But the good thing about ANCOVA, which is different to simply dividing by body weight or by ratios, is it allows you to put in that intercept on the y-axis and therefore have a slope that represents all of your animals. Okay, so how does it work? So in really simple terms, what we can do is we can look at a couple of groups of animals. So this is a group with increased oxygen consumption or energy expenditure per gram of animal. Um, and you can see that the red dots here and the blue dots here have got identical regression slopes because I've copied and pasted them in PowerPoint. Um, but if we were to look at these parallel slopes, we can see that they are offset. The slope of the red mice is above the slope of the blue mice. And if they were all at the same weight and we slid them all down this line, then they would have a higher oxygen consumption at the same body weight. Conversely, we have another set of animals. The red ones here have higher energy expenditure or oxygen consumption than blue ones. 
But we can see if we were to slide them all along the same line this time, they're on the same regression line. If they all weighed the same, it would be identical. They would just slide up and down that line and they would all have the same energy expenditure. Now, you'll never have the situation that the animals have the same regression slide. They will always be slightly different. And what ANCOVA does is it actually uses an idealized regression. It uses the um, weighted by the number of animals, but it uses the same regression slope for both groups. Um, and so that's quite important. Um, and you can sort of see how that works here. So different slope here, different slope here. And we're using that same regression, regression line for each group. And why that's important is because you need to have the same regression slopes. And we'll come on to that in a second because that's not always the case that those regression slopes are important. And so what ANCOVA does is once you've got these two different, uh, you've got your groups, you've got your idealized regression, is it, as I said, it's gonna slide the animals along. And then it's gonna apply a test, um, which is not that dissimilar to the t-test. And most statistical tests are gonna work on the same principle. And that is, uh, if you've got group A and you've got group B, and in this case, they're different. And we can compare um, how well having a single mean for all eight animals is works, how good it is at fitting that data versus having two means. And so in this case, does having two means be um, explain our data better than having one? Now, intuitively, we can look at it and say, yes, it absolutely does. And conversely, on this data set, we can actually look at it and say, well, in this case, no, it does not. Because essentially the distances that these points are from these lines is not different between with having two means or having one mean. And so it is no better. Whereas in this case, the distance of this point to its mean line is much, much shorter than in this case, particularly for say this one, which goes to here, this one has to go all the way down to here. And if those differences in the distances between one mean and two means, if two means sufficiently reduces those distances, and we always work with squares to avoid the problem of negative numbers, if it reduces those, the sum of all the squares of uh, the distance between our individual mouse data point and mean and a common mean versus individual means, if it reduces that sum of squares sufficiently, um, given a, a large enough number of animals, then that will give us a significant result. Okay, so in this case, the way ANCOVA works is we go, okay, well, we've got our two regression lines, idealized regression lines, one for each group, and we can sort of look and go, okay, well, this is this far away from our regression line. This is the center of this is this far. We can square it up and we can add those up. And then we can do it again with a single regression line and you can see we get bigger squares. So if we sum all those squares up, is having two better than one is basically what we're looking at. So how about some real data? This is really old data from my PhD thesis. So it's oxygen because back then we weren't working with energy expenditure um, with this particular system. We had oxygen in milliliters per minute per mouse and we had body weight in grams. And if we use a traditional milliliters per minute per kg, the 0.75 analysis, there is absolutely no significance between these groups. But if we run an ANCOVA, what we actually find is that we get out a significant effect of genotype as well as a significant effect of mass. So we've got a valid ANCOVA on the mass requirement. So does body weight correlate with energy expenditure or oxygen consumption? Yes, it does. And is there a significant difference of genotype? Yes, there is. Um, and then we can also extract something called the estimated marginal means. And this is the thing that I've been talking about. What would the energy expenditure, the mean energy expenditure or oxygen consumption be if all the animals weighed the same weight? Well, this is telling us if all the animals weighed 33.36 grams, which is the, actually the average body weight of all the animals, then we would see uh, group one would have a 2.3 milliliters per minute oxygen consumption and group two, the knockouts would have a two milliliters per minute. And that would be statistically significant based on the previous model. Now, obviously I've mentioned already that you can have a problem if the regression lines are not equal and they cross in the area of interest because then your idealized regression line is really not that ideal. It's quite a long way from each of them. 
And that means that the relationship between the body weight and your variable of interest, energy expenditure, oxygen consumption is different. And if it's different, that's a problem because um, we are not looking at the same thing. And you'll see an actual real world example of this. So in a sense, we're saying, oh, okay, our wild types and our knockouts, for each gram gain, they're going to gain a certain amount of energy, which is part of sort of a classic Y equals MX plus C, but that's difference for the wild types and the knockouts. So you'll get a skewing of the data and it will not give you a valid calculation of metabolic rate corrected for body weight. So um, what do you do when the regression lines uh, are not equal and they do cross in this area of interest? Well, you can test to see if they are valid. It's the first thing you can do. And the way you do this is you introduce an interaction term. And so what the interaction term is going to do, going back to these, is it's going to test is having a single slope, is having a single slope uh, better or worse than having two slopes, i.e. two different actual regression lines. Um, and so the way it will do that is it will introduce this interaction term. And if that interaction term comes out as significantly different, it means that your slopes are not the same. And so once you've got your data, you can report it. Um, interestingly, you can't actually really get individual data points. So this is something that comes out with Nature Publishing Group. Um, in particular, I've started to ask for dots essentially on these. You can't do it with an ANCOVER output. So if you want to show a bar chart like this, if you want to actually show individual data points for mice, you're going to want to plot a scatter plot of your body weight against energy expenditure. Um, and you then potentially next to it, if you want to show um, the ANCOVER corrected energy expenditure, can show the bar chart but without the scatter points. Um, and so in this case, we're just showing oxygen consumption from seven month old male mice fed standard laboratory chow diet, data collected from free living mice with ad libitum access to food over the period of 48 hours and equals eight group. Um, oxygen consumption expressed as adjusted means based on normalized mouse weight of 33.36 grams determined using ANCOVA. This is a bit PhD thesis -y. I mean, you would simply put in um, metabolic rate in your um, figure legend nowadays, and then you put in the methods that you've done it using ANCOVA. Okay, so in the practical session, we're going to go through testing your data is valid and how to analyze your data, essentially. Okay, so testing the data is valid. So in this case, we have smaller mice with lower energy expenditure. Okay, so the energy expenditure, this is raw energy expenditure, is significantly lower in the red mice than the blue mice. However, the body weight, whilst it's not significantly different, does tend to be somewhat lower. And so the question then we have, given that we know that they're not, you know, essentially cutting through the origin, um, is whether this reduction in energy expenditure is actually dependent on the genotype, or is it all explained by the slightly lower body weight? That's the question we have. Um, so the animals have this lower body weight, and um, while they don't have a significant difference in body weight, um, it does have a tendency to be lower. Does this explain the energy expenditure? And so we need to therefore normalize for body weight using ANCOVA. And so the first thing you can always do to determine whether you're going to be able to run your ANCOVA and get a feel for it is plot the body weight on the x-axis and the energy expenditure on the y-axis of a scatter plot. And so when we look, do this, we can see two things which are really quite nice. Okay, the first thing is the R squared for each of the regression lines is really quite decent. It's about 0.6 for both of them, um, for series one and series two. But we can also see immediately our lines are parallel, which is another thing we want for ANCOVA. They want, we want them to be roughly parallel and they're not overlapping. And that's great because this means that this data looks like it's almost certainly we're gonna be able to run an ANCOVA on it. And then we can use that ANCOVA to find out is this difference given that some of these points are kind of overlapping each other on the Y axis, is that gonna be sufficient to give us a significant difference in metabolic rate? So how to actually run it? So the first thing you do is you take your data and you can do this over different time point periods, but you're gonna to wanna to reduce all of these tens of thousands of data points for things like VO2, energy expenditure, 
you want to reduce them down to a single variable for the analysis of covariance. So this is a really important point. You're going to work with a single energy expenditure variable. Now, you could be doing it for four hours, say, if you've done an acute intervention. But in very often, you're going to be working with colorimetry runs 24 or 48 hours. You just average that data. And so if you do that and you average each of these columns, you can pull um, energy expenditure. Um, and you can see here we've got uh, an energy expenditure for wild type one mouse of 39. In this case, it's joules per minute per mouse. And we have an average weight, weight in, weight out averaged at 30.8 grams. And so this is the data we're going to work with. Now, the software we're going to use is called JASP, and we need to format it for JASP. So if you're going to use the software, you're going to want to have four columns. You're going to want to have uh, just a description of what you're doing. So mouse, wild type one down to seven, knockout one down to seven. Genotype, so this is going to be our categorical variable, wild type one, knockout to two. Energy expenditure, we have our energy expenditure averaged over our time period of interest. Um, and this is in joules per minute per mouse. You could be using kilocals per hour, you could be using watts, and then the average body weight here. That's it. This is the data we're going to use to calculate that metabolic rate. And so we have to save it for JASP as a CSV. We save it as a CSV, and then we come to JASP. Um, and what we can do is then click here on open a data file. And we can open that data file, and we can open our data, in this case, traininganalysis.csv. And it will appear, and it will come in like this. Now, you can click on these little icons if they're in the wrong type of data. Energy expenditure and average weight are both linear data. So that's how our regression describes it. Mouse, well, this has got letters in it, so it's a string. And then genotype is categorical data, one and two in this case. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to ANOVA, and we're going to select analysis of covariance. And then we need to put our data in our correct places. So our energy expenditure goes in as the dependent variable. Our fixed factor in this case is genotype. And our covariate is average weight. And if we plug all of this in, what um, JASP very nicely does for us is it puts out a very nice, on the right-hand side, um, box as we go along with the analysis. So in this case, it will say uh, genotype significant, average weight, significant. And just to zoom in on that, you can see it's putting out all of our statistics, the sum of squares that we talked about earlier, um, degrees of freedom, which is related heavily to how many ends uh, we have in, the, in terms of the mice, as well as how many parameters there are in our model, mean squares, F statistics, so this is an F test, and then uh, the p-value, and it's saying both of these are significant. The next thing we want to do is get the values of our energy expenditure if all our mice weigh the same. And so in this case, we go to something called marginal means. And then we select genotype. And we click, click genotype across. And it spits out the marginal means. And we can zoom in again. And we can see the marginal means here are 40 for group one, the wild types, and 382 for the knockouts. So we've got a reduction in energy expenditure even after correcting for the difference in body weight. One thing to note, I have seen people use outputs like this from SPSS um, or equally from JASP. In ANCOVA models, they do not spit out an SD, they spit out a standard error. If you copy and paste this into PRISM, be very careful you are telling PRISM it is a standard error, not a standard deviation. Because then PRISM, if you ask it to do stats and you tell it the end number and the marginal means, and then you tell it this is an SD, it will say things are significant when they're not, or vice versa. And the p-values PRISM will spit out will be nothing like these ones. So what we end up with then is this result, which is energy expenditure. Again, the same concept from seven-month-old mice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and n equals 7, 32.6 grams. So we have a significant difference in metabolic rate here, as well as our initial difference in energy expenditure. And just of note, if we actually do reanalyze this energy expenditure joules per minute to kick to the 0.75, you will see it is not significantly different. So that's all good so far. 
what we need to now do is see, is our ANCOVA model valid? Okay, as you can see, the lines do not cross in the region of interest. So this is looking like it's a pretty valid model. Um, and in fact, they're almost parallel. And what we can do therefore is we can test this by we can chain, go back to JASP and we can change the model. So we can drop down the model and select like genotype and average weight and have those as terms in our model and we get the same p-values. But now we can add a third thing, which is both of them selected, click across and it adds a genotype times average weight components of the model. This is no longer a valid ANCOVA. This is purely a method of testing whether your ANCOVA is valid. You should never have your genotype times average weight in the model for calculating those estimated marginal means. And what this shows therefore is that there is a non-significant uh, interaction between genotype times average weight. So two parallel lines will give you a p-value of one on a genotype times average weight interaction and lines crossing at 90 degrees to each other, so a perfect cross, that would give you a p-value of zero. So what do you do then if your ANCOVA is invalid? So what do you do with your data? So let's say we've got this situation where there just isn't a significant correlation with body weight. So our body weight term is not significant. What do you do? Well, you can plot, present this graph. Your red dotted mice have a higher energy expenditure than your blue mice. And they have roughly the same body weight. So you can at least infer some information that these mice are probably hypermetabolic but you can't formally prove there's a difference in metabolic rate, but you may have other supporting evidence to really push the concept that this is true. And this happens a reasonable amount. So in this case, we've got a genotype effect that's significant. Average weight is not a predictor in your ANCOVA model. So this is what this will look like. If you run your ANCOVA model, your average weight will be non-significant, so you can't run the ANCOVA, and you should absolutely not report the estimated marginal needs. You just state this, you state a genotype effect on energy expenditure, but you can't calculate metabolic rate and you can't calculate this graph from the estimated marginal means. Okay, so this is a slightly different situation. This is about when there is an interaction between slopes. And so I've taken a pretty extreme example. I've taken a bunch of orange mice here, which were housed at 28 degrees C measure, and I've taken a bunch of mice here, which were housed at uh, five degrees C, I think, somewhere between um, five and eight, I can't remember the exact data set. And you can see that the energy expenditure of the mice in the cold is spectacularly higher. These mice are averaging something like 60 joules per minute per mouse, and these mice are averaging something like 32. So it's, it's basically doubled their energy expenditure by moving them from the warm to the cold. And what's interesting is the slopes are different. So we have a significant temperature times body weight interaction. And if we go back, we can see that this slope is much steeper than this, which is much flatter. And th in this case, it is again invalid to basically calculate the estimated marginal means, the energy expenditure of the mice corrected for body weight. Okay? But you can present this data and you can state there is a significant interaction term um, but you can't do this. And actually, this is quite interesting because if you look at the original CalR paper from Alex Banks, and I think perfectly valid as an ar argument, and probably right, he suggests that the presence of a significant interaction term is indicative of altered thermogenesis. And in this case, we've definitely got altered thermogenesis because we've gone warm to cold. But you can also potentially see similar things with animals with different heat dissipation. And there are other methods and um, Jan Nedergaard and Barbara Cannon have done a lot on this um, about measuring mice at multiple different temperatures. And it's worth having a look at. If your first pass result you get indicates an alteration in essentially the slopes, then you may have a thermogenic phenotype and it may well be worth looking into how this mouse responds if you have the capabilities uh, in terms of energy expenditure at different environmental temperatures. And so the final one is when the data is non-overlapping. And so this is a problem when you have really big differences in body weight. Um, and so in this case, the ANCOVA breaks down because formally, if you have no overlap, you cannot actually really determine whether these lines are parallel. Um, because, and it's particularly problematic in cases like this, where you have uh, essentially lines which are not similar slopes, 
because you don't know if this would be two parallel lines potentially or whether it's a curve. And this, this isn't actually particularly an uncommon shape to the data that you can get if the big difference in terms of the body weight of these animals is fat mass versus lean mass. And so if you have this situation, you know, you're basically gonna have to just present this data and you can say the energy expenditure is higher, the body weight is higher, but it's not really possible to determine what's going on in terms of metabolic rate. ANCOVA, I've shown you today, I've really focused on body weight and energy expenditure, but it's worth noting that any data that contains a covariate, e.g. tissue weights, bigger mice have bigger livers, and it doesn't necessarily cut the origin. Bigger mice have more adipose tissue. Again, it doesn't necessarily cut the origin. You can do all of this with ANCOVA. You don't have to go liver weight, body weight, heart weight, body weight, um, adipose tissue, body weight ratios. Effects of time on responses, you can use that. Effects of doses of drugs. And this actually may be better with nonlinear modeling. So you'll often get things like sigmoidal responses. And you can do some of that in PRISM. Or if you're, if you're really fancy, you can use some software called non-mem icon on it. Um, you can actually use it for things like effects of allele number. So wild type HET knockout. So if you have haploinsufficiency and your HET sit between your um, wild types and knockouts in terms of a variable, you can correct for the number of alleles. Litter sizes, so if you're looking at the weight of pups and you have sufficient numbers, you could, instead of um, experimentally manipulating your litter sizes, you could potentially look to see if an uh, effect is determined by the size of the litter size. So, you know, a litter of eight pups, largely you're gonna, on a, normally you're gonna have slightly smaller pups than if it's a litter of four. And you can think of many other examples. And so overall, I would say analysis of energy expenditure for uh, energy balance should not be normalized to body weight. You should just use the raw data for energy balance. And if you're going to normalize energy expenditure of food intake um, in order to determine metabolic rate, that should be done using ANCOVA. And if it's not possible, then just stick with your scatter plot, showing your body weights, showing your energy expenditures. And then you can talk about that data but you can say we can't actually calculate the metabolic rate with ANCOVA rather than being tempted to go down the division by some comparator like body weight, body weight to the 75. Okay, so that is essentially the sort of talk part of this. But what I thought I would do now is just show you um, how JASP works. So what we can do is we can go to JASP and we can go to File, Open. And uh, we can go to computer and browse, and we can get our training analysis that I showed you from the talk and just open it. And it will import. And so we can get rid of this one. And what you'll see is we have the same columns. So we've got mouse. And as I mentioned, you can select scale, ordinal, or nominal data. So this is scale, ordinal, or nominal. And this is scalar data. And you can select those things. And then once we've got that data, go to the ANCOVA and you select, and sorry, the ANOVA tab and you select ANCOVA. And in this case, we've got some empty columns, which are V5, V6, V7 variables, but we'll ignore those. But we can go genotype, that's going to be our fixed factor. Energy expenditure is going to be our dependent variable. And average weight in this case is our covariate. And in fact, we can just flip back here and say, if before we put the average weight in, it will give us the p-value for genotype, 0 0.007. We put the average weight into it, and now it gives us the p-value for genotype once corrected for body weight, and also the p-value for whether our body weight is significant um, as a predictor of energy expenditure in our model. In other words, do they correlate well enough, body weight and energy expenditure, for it to be a significant correlation? Um, once we've adjusted for the groups. And in this case, it's absolutely true. Um, and then we can go to our um, marginal means tab, select genotype, bang, just go across. And now we have our energy, our marginal means, which is our energy expenditure. And that is at the average body weight of all the animals. So 40.16 and 38.23. So that's that simple. And this is the data you can output. Final thing we can do is get rid of this, and we can go to our model. And at the moment, our model is an ANCOVA model, so it has genotype and average weight, but it has no interaction term. We can test if our ANCOVA is valid, 
by adding that interaction term. And then we scroll across, we can see the p-value as I showed in the talk, 0.737. It's non-significant. So that's basically it. And that's how you would go about doing it. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope this has been useful.